them to understand and to occupy at least part of the next session with me. But uh, <clears throat> this uh, session I'd like to discuss with you the subjects of justification and sanctification. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to get our blackboard back over here because I want to have you see how it fits into the gospel plan. <clears throat> you can talk about the gospel from different vantage points, just like you can go see a house and view it from disadvantage points, the back, the side, the rear, etc. And uh, <clears throat> uh, you can describe the same building but do it a little differently <clears throat> or from a different tact or a different approach. And the same thing now is true with the gospel. You can talk about uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and repentance and baptism and the gifts of the Holy Ghost and so forth and the blessings they bring into your life and view things from this vantage. Now there's another vantage, often did that uh, to me crystallizes the gospel plan and uh, that uh, helps broaden understanding and meaning. And this is to view the doctrine in the... Uh, uh, pattern and program of justification and sanctification. Let me get our little mortal bucket up here on the board in order to see things rightly. Now let's say that this mortal bucket represents us in our mortal state. Here's the presence of God. <clears throat> here we are down here hugging terra firma. Most of us uh, hugging it more than others. <clears throat> and uh, striving now to get back into the presence of God. That's the great challenge, to fulfill that program by which, uh, through the atonement and the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, we can finally move from on up through where the next step, like the brother of Jared, is in, and uh, be redeemed from the fall. Now, if you were to take that program, that pathway along there from here on up, you can divide it appropriately into two or three major doctrinal era, uh, areas. One is the doctrine of justification. If you got your Yerman Thummim, you can read that. And the second, then, is the doctrine of sanctification. And then that reaches on up into the higher realms of the gospel of receiving the sacred sealing powers of the holy priesthood and entering back into God's presence, see. Uh, so that if you progress in this way of speaking, you start out with the need to meet the requirements of justification. And then you need to know what the idea of justification entails how it centers in Christ, what's your relationship to the idea, how it pertains then to faith and to repentance and to baptism, and how it finally relates then to the further program of how to be sanctified and how uh, to uh, achieve a relationship in which through Christ we can be sanctified and what sanctification means and how it's to be attained. And then from there on up, as you become pure and holy and uh, filled with faith like the brother of Jared and others, then you get into the upper reaches of the gospel where the Lord himself begins to teach you and where you have the blessings of the gospel open to you in uh, the living revelations and they can reach up into the rending of the veil and the penetration of the veil where you see and behold and know that that which you have been teaching is true. When I was a young boy of 15 years of age, an old patriarch laid his hands on my head, and he said in substance that the day will come where your spiritual eye will be quickened, and you will see and behold and know. And I want to bear you my testimony that that is a reality. I know the fulfillment of that old patriarch's prophetic statement. And this has to do then with some of gospel life. And you finally learn that God is real, that Christ is the most alive person there is in this universe. 
but you need to traverse that path. And the Lord in his mercy reaches down then and strives with you. Now we want to discuss then today this great challenge of this context. And let's start then and do it uh, methodically one idea after another. Now justification and sanctification then leads us on up. And uh, here in section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and this is a marvelous section in many ways, uh, it uh, gives to us one of the classic statements of the gospel. And I don't want to take the time on that, I would like, but we don't have that time. But it talks about the Book of Mormon containing the fullness of the gospel unto the Gentiles and also to the Jews. And then it describes that gospel from verse 9 on down through, involving the doctrine of the fall and the atonement of Christ, the need to be trained, changed, and transformed and regenerated. And then at the conclusion of this great statement of gospel concept and doctrine and idea, then in verse 30, the prophet writes by revelation as follows. He says, And we know that justification through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just and true. Now, he doesn't explain it. He just says justification through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just and true. He gives us to understand very clearly then that it's a true doctrine. Then he goes on in verse 31, and he says, And we know also that sanctification through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just and true to all those who love and serve God with all their might, minds, and strength. And there is the key. It's the love of God and service in the way of his kingdom and the pattern of his holy priesthood with all your might, mind, and strength. And then he adds this word of caution in verse 32. But there is a possibility that man may fall from grace and depart from the living God. Therefore, let the church take heed and pray always, lest they fall into temptation. Yea, and even let those who are sanctified take heed also. All right. What then, by definition, do we mean by justification? The word justification comes from the word justify, and that even goes back to a more brief word, just. A person who is just, or a person who is justified. An individual who is justified, then, is one who is blameless, or he's one who has been exonerated. Uh, he's uh, in a state, then, of either having never transgressed divine law. And hence, on the day of judgment, if that were the case throughout his whole life, where he'd never transgressed any divine law, he could stand at the bar of God's judgment and justice, and he could say with a clear conscience, Lord, I have never broken any of your commandments. I am therefore justified. The demands of thy holy law have no hold upon me. Now, this is what it means to be justified by law. Now, do we have anyone here who can make it thus far on this basis? Am I the only one with my hand in the air? <laughs> I will come down then and be humble with the rest of you. <laughs> All right, but there was one who did it this way. And his name was Jesus. And he traversed the path of life from spirit birth to Calvary and beyond without transgressing one of the laws of the Father. And therefore stood acquitted and justified by law and demonstrated it can be done. It can be done. <clears throat> but so far as we are concerned, then mankind in general, the words of Lehi, 
In 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 5, or appropriate, where he says, By the law no flesh is justified, or by the law men are cut off. So, so far as we are concerned, then, no flesh is justified of ourselves. And uh, if we are going to be justified, then there is no way in which we of ourselves can claim that status or can achieve that status. We can't either claim it or achieve it. And hence, we're in a lost and a fallen state. And it's a hopeless state except for the redemptive program which our Father in heaven gave when he sent his only begotten Son into the world. And all that we had in the way of hopes rested on his perfect walk with the Father, his integrity, his fidelity, his purity, so that even though he were to come to this earth under the conditions where the veil is drawn and while he was conceived with life in himself, he still underwent uh, a a situation of uh, forgetfulness, of uh, being under the veil, as it were, and to have to start from square one and move on. But we had such faith in his integrity and such faith that he would not only do that, but in the process he would never transgress and therefore disqualify himself and therefore throw the whole thing uh, down the tube, if I can put it that way, that we sustained and voted on that program, and in that sense we acted by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the very step by which we came to mortality. That principle of faith in him and his integrity and the fact that he would do it, that he would get the ball across the end zone and he would do it with a perfect walk, we then bought that and had such faith in that that we were ready to come to mortality and vote for the whole program. It had all rested, the whole plan of redemption rested on faith on the character and the integrity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All right, but that means then that there must be a program of grace. Now, sometimes we don't fully appreciate the word grace. Some of the sectarians have so much grace that it's a disgrace. and. Uh, <clears throat> They expect then that uh, Jesus is going to do everything, and it's all we got to do is sit on the sideline like a, a, a bunch of people in the bleachers and say, rah, 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 Jesus. Now, that's not quite the way that it's done. I have heard sectarian ministers myself use that very symbol of uh, we're merely spectators and we're merely saying, rah, 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 Jesus, and he does it all. Now, that's so much grace that it's a disgrace. Now, grace by definition, and this is a trite definition, I don't think that a human mind has the capacity to define grace. Grace uh, is considerably more than that. The grace of the Father is the conferral of his godhood on man. That's what the grace of the Father is. It's the conferral of his godhood on man. Man in his fallen state, but transformed and regenerated by his love, and purified and lifted up, uh, so that the grace of God then is a huge thing beyond finite comprehension, so big in its uh, details and in its ramifications and in its blessings and its intricacies. It's so great that the human mind cannot comprehend the grace of God. But the grace of God is begins to be made manifest when Christ, standing in Gethsemane as he did, and voluntarily allowing the divine powers of life within himself to withdraw to the extent that there was literally a disintegration of spirit and body got underway, and he shed blood from every pore. This then was the beginning of grace unto the remission of our sins. And this is what it took. And Christ then, having paid that debt, then can begin to offer his grace unto us. And we call this then the doctrine of justification by grace. Now that doctrine requires that we 
as individuals do something. And we'll get into the ramifications now of this concept of grace. But uh, uh, it's much bigger than we think of, and uh, it has different manifestations. It has manifestations in relation to what we call the preparatory gospel. It has manifestations in regard to the basic program of the everlasting gospel. It has manifestations in the holy house of the Lord and the sealing powers, and it has manifestations in the grace that's made manifest in resurrection. You're raised up by the glory of Christ, and his grace is made manifest, and finally you're glorified in grace. And that is, that's only the beginning of it. When you get fully glorified by and through the grace of Christ, that's not the end. That's just getting your toe fully squared up on the starting line of eternity. And the grace of God will go on continually, and the grace of Christ will go on continually and open up to you in the great plan of eternal progression and the great vistas that lie beyond open up to you the higher regions of life, glory, power, and endowment. See? So the grace of God is much bigger than we can comprehend. Now, Lehi, for example, in Second Nephi chapter 2, <coughs> is talking here about uh, uh, the need now to, to proclaim this program. Wherefore, he says, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah, who layeth down his life according to the flesh, and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should rise. Now no flesh can dwell in his presence except by the merits, the mercy, and the grace of Christ. And there you must start. And in this, then, you see the meaning of John chapter 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoso would believe in him then might not perish but would have everlasting life. And the Father not only gave him and then walked off and had a fishing trip, while the Son was here, the Father gave him, centered his divine nature in him, and was made manifest because, as Jesus said to Philip, the words that I speak, I speak not of myself, but he, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the work, see. And so through Christ, the Father manifested himself and becomes uh, in and through Christ the great revelation or revelator of truth and righteousness to men on earth. All right, another statement here in 2 Nephi chapter 25, where he sums it up in these words, verse 23. Uh, he says, For we labor diligently, and that requires a little work. We labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved, after all that we can do. Now, sometimes we've had a hassle for the, you know, the last years since the Restoration uh, with the sectarians who have more grace than they ought to have. And sometimes, and I say this, uh, and I hope it's taken in the right spirit, we just push to the other end of the spectrum and push the idea of works. And we quote James 2, that show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And then we merely conclude from that, which is a misconception, that works themselves are going to save us. Now, James wasn't talking about salvation by works. James was talking about salvation by faith. But he said that the kind of faith that will save is the kind of faith that will regenerate the human heart. It will transform the human nature. It will so affects the individual that he will live or she will live outside his or her life in service to others. And show you show me your faith without your works. 
See, he's not talking about works as the primary, but the secondary. See, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. See, and so works then aren't the means of salvation. They're the evidences of true faith, and they're the evidences of living grace. But at times then we just get on the old works bandwagon and we quote something against the sectarians and they quote their grace so much that it's a disgrace and we get locked in battle. And in some measure, some measure, we need to share in the fact that we haven't been uh, uh, as understanding in what we teach as we ought to. And I don't say that critically, I'm just saying that, that we have uh, at times pushed the humanistic button too much. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't serve with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. And that doesn't leave anything over. See? And that's what the Lord said in section 20, verse 31, isn't it? You're sanctified because you serve with all your heart, might, mind. But it's even then, even then a grace situation. So Nephi says, we know that it's by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. And then he goes on and he says, uh, and we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for a remission of their sins. Now, let's go, for example, to the day of judgment, just in our minds. And let's say on the day of judgment you stand at the judgment bar and there is our Lord and Savior who went through Gethsemane and the cross and he's standing there in the role of what the scriptures call an advocate. I am your advocate with the Father. Now an advocate is one who pleads the cause of someone else. When we have someone who gets in trouble and they're hauled into the court system of the city of Snowflake and you go to bat for them and you go to advocate their cause, basically you go there and tell the court how good that guy is after all. This was merely out of character and that they ought to be lenient. Or you go there to say, I also saw that and the report about him is not true and he is being falsely charged. But your focus as an advocate is on that person. That's where your focus is, isn't it? Your focus is on him bringing out the good parts or contending the testimony with counter-testimony in order to help him or her uh, meet that challenge where he's confronted now with the demands of law and he's standing before the courts and someone then goes to bat for him and is his advocate. Now Jesus will go to bat for us as our advocate, but note on what basis. Let me turn to section 45. Of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 3, beginning. And you read this very, very carefully. And as you read it, you'll find that he doesn't say one word about us, hardly. He doesn't say, here's Andrus. I'm going to be his advocate. You know, he's a great guy after all. Now, most people don't like his looks. But he's a great guy after all. You see that? And I want to tell you why. And so he lines up the reason why I'm a great guy and why the Father ought to let me in the kingdom. Now note he doesn't do that. Note how he does it. He says, listen to him who is the advocate with the Father, who is pleading your cause before him, saying, now note what he says, Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin. Now he hasn't said, mentioned me yet. What's he talking about in his plea of advocacy? He's talking about himself and his atonement, right? Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy son which was shed, the blood of him who gavest, whom thou gavest, that thyself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, spare these my brethren that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have eternal or everlasting life. Now, how much does he say about us? We believe. That's what he says about us, isn't it? On what basis does he advocate our cause? On the basis of his atonement 
and on the basis of permission to extend his grace to us because we receive him. You see that? His atonement and then the extension of his grace to us. And on that basis then, the Father says, all right, you've paid the debt and your grace is given to them and they are justified by that grace. Now that's justification by grace, isn't it? That's justification by grace. Now in that sense then, that's the basic part of the program. But uh, uh, it's like a house. You know, when we moved to Provo way back in 56, we rented an apartment and I got the idea because I had a PhD that I could build a house. Uh, we'd helped renovate a, a building back in Syracuse and made it into a chapel and I'd learned a little bit. And besides that, I was born and raised on a farm and you always know about at least uh, nailing up boards on the pig pen and on the calf patcher and all that kind of thing, see? And so I knew the business end of a hammer. Didn't know too much about the finer parts of it, but I knew the business end of a hammer. And I decided that I knew how to build a house or I could do it. And so I took that summer off and we laid the footings and, and began to go to work. And I'd be there bright and early about five o'clock in the morning and there were nail boards and set up uh, uh, petitions and uh, put the roof on. By July the 4th, I was sitting on top of the roof when they had the July 4th program there in, in uh, uh, Provo. Our house was just, uh, oh, just a little uh, north of the Bell Tower. You go to the stadium and go up to Stadium Avenue toward the temple and there's the there's the, a chapel and then the, the MTC on there and our home was on the north side of one of those houses that look out over the over the Ed Sea. So I sat up there on the ridge and, and listened while while and watched while the fireworks went on that 4th of July. But uh, I learned something out of that, more than just which end of the nail needs to go in first. I learned something out of that. I learned that houses have different looks, that when you build the front of a house, you should build it differently than the back of the house, and uh, that our house looked different from the front and the back. Now, you know, you kind of accept that and you never really think about it until you have to build one of them. And uh, so I learned then that, that uh, you can be looking at the same house and seeing different things. And I learned that there are different dimensions to, to a particular subject. And I kind of applied that to the gospel. Now, there's such a thing as sanctification by grace. And there's also, if you take another look from a different vantage point now, there's such a thing as the doctrine of justification by faith. Now, for example, over here in Romans chapter 5, you have one of the great classic statements in uh, the New Testament, and it comes from Paul. I used to, when I was a kid, I got the idea somewhere along the line that Paul was the first great sectarian. And uh, I held that idea until I mastered the Book of Mormon, found out what the gospel was, and then went back and read Paul. And uh, I've sorely repented of that. Paul was one of the few men who knew what the gospel was. One of the few men. Some of us know things about the gospel, and we can say good things, but when it comes right down to the crux and the essence and the real substance of what the gospel is, there are very, very few people who really know what that is and who can talk from that dimension of substance and of basic essence. Now, Paul was one who could do that. And he says this now in uh, uh, chapter 5, Therefore, being justified, this is verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, you can read that statement over, over and over again and analyze it and just get lots and lots out of it because it's just packed full of basic essential ideas. The one I want to bring out here today now is that we're justified by faith. All right, now, how does justification by faith correlate and tie in with the doctrine of justification by grace? 
Well, the doctrine of justification by grace essentially says we are lost and fallen. We're hopeless. We're in a fallen state. We can't do it of our own. And it says also that Jesus came to earth and did do it. He, he trod the path and did it perfectly and paid the debt and mastered the situation for all of us. And then he has the tender love and mercy to say, all right, now, since I have done it and I've got control, if you will have faith in me, and it's not faith as the first principle of the gospel, it's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's quite a bit different sometimes. All right, if you will have faith in me, faith that I was conceived with life within me, that I lived a sinless life, that I paid the debt, that I broke the bands of debt, that I acquired the fullness and that I ascended into the Father, and that he has given me all power in heaven and earth, and committed me to the challenge of bringing you up to get that same fullness, if you will. Now, if you have faith in that, then I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll extend the powers of my atonement to you, and give you a remission of sins. All right, now what does it take in order for Jesus to make that extension? Does he do it just arbitrarily, without concern for me? Or what I do? And the answer is no. There's some strings attached. I have to have faith in him. And in direct proportion to the degree that I have that faith, then he opens up the floodgate of his divine truth and power, you see. And so justification then is by faith. And that is a true doctrine, you see. It's a true doctrine. And uh, in that sense, then, it doesn't militate against the doctrine of justification by grace. The grace doctrine is the foundation of the house. Justification by faith is looking at it from a particular vantage point as to how we can approach that grace and receive it unto ourselves and what are the stipulations by which that is done. Okay? All right, now, in that sense, then, justification by faith is a true doctrine, and there is such a thing as justification by righteous works. Works without faith avail nothing. True faith, as we've said, though, transforms a person's soul so that his righteous works are a barometer of his or her faith. And uh, uh, let me just read a, a little comment that I wrote on that here in, in my book, uh, uh, Principles of Perfection. Like George Bernard Shaw, I like to quote myself once in a while to add spice to my conversation. Uh, <laughs> now, here's what I put down. <laughs> the righteous works of men are not unto justification, but unto reconciliation. You know the difference? What does reconciliation mean? There is a doctrine of reconciliation. There's two expressions. First, as Christ utilized it. Reconciliation means there's been an estrangement made, and you've got to bring together. It's the idea that Brother Talmage brings out of atonement being at one month. It's to make them one. It's designed to, to, to reconcile. Now, there's two aspects to the doctrine of reconciliation. One is the need to reconcile the divine law of the Father. Now, who did that? And the answer is Christ. He answered the ends of the law. He reconciled the demands of eternal justice. Now, the other side of the coin of reconciliation is that we must be reconciled unto God through Christ. You see that? And how do we get reconciled? By faith in Christ, by repentance, by bringing our lives in harmony, by recognizing that he is the gift offered to the Father and appointed to the Father to be the way, the truth, and the life. And in that sense, then, we be, our challenge is to be reconciled to him. And he, then, having reconciled divine law, pleads our case, as we read from section 45, as our advocate, not on the basis of our reconciliation to him, but on the basis that he has reconciled the demands of the Father's law. You see that? All right, now, read this famous statement. The righteous works of man are not unto justification. I, don't, I didn't pay the debt. Jesus did that, see? 
They're not unto justification, but unto reconciliation through the grace of Jesus Christ. And then man's righteous works flow as an outward expression of the hope and faith of an enlightened and grateful heart. Works of themselves do not save man, but by hope and faith coupled with obedience to the ordinances of the gospel, the righteous works of service Man is reconciled to God. Man's righteous works merely register the presence and strength of reconciling qualities within him. See, But when we are reconciled then through our righteous works as the outflow of the abundant heart, then righteous works become part of the great program of justification. Now, is that as clear as mud? You see that? All right. Uh, Let me put it this way. In the gospel plan, there are two, two divisions to this idea of remission of sins. There is one what can be called obtaining a remission of sins. And then if you read chapter 4 of the book of Mosiah, which is one of the greatest statements on this subject anywhere in, in sacred literature, there is such a thing as retaining a remission of sins from day to day. <laughs> now, the obtaining of a remission of sins requires the righteous works of faith and of obedience and of repentance and of baptism. And I don't care how difficult it is to get to the baptismal font. If you had to walk from here to Siberia, and when you got there and found that the font was frozen over and there's no wood or coal to heat the thing up but you had then to get that thing thawed out in some water and be baptized all the effort you had to do to do that would not pay the debt of your sins christ's blood alone and his atonement does it see and your works then merely bring you there and so the righteous works though of uh obeying the gospel and coming into the program, these then finally add up to the obtaining of a remission of sins, see, the obtaining the remission. And then you ask yourself a question, what do you do 20 years later after you've been baptized and you've been through 20 years of mortal experience? You know, I was over in Hawaii when our favorite number two son was eight years of age. And we got permission before we went from our bishop to have a white pants party there on Lai uh, Beach and on his on his eighth birthday. And so bright and early, before anyone was up, we got the kids up and headed down to the beach. And with a select group of friends there, we had the uh, baptismal uh, meeting and ceremony. And I walked out into the. Uh, ocean with him and there performed the rite of baptism. And then we came back and had our concluding program. And then as we walked on the way back to our apartment with his hand in mine, he looked up at me and says, Daddy, he says, you know, I need to be baptized twice. And I didn't quite catch on at first. And I said, what's the matter? Don't you think this one took? And I kind of quipped I could do it the second time. and do it twice and only bring you up once and that would really do it <laughs> but no he says that no daddy i need to be baptized twice i said well tell me what you mean he said well i need to be baptized now and then i need to be baptized just before i die <laughs> now i knew that this message of repentance had got through to him <laughs> i knew that he was also thinking about it and i says now why so he says, well, so I can get a remission of sins now, and then so I can also have a remission of sins just as I go back to Heavenly Father. And I thought that was pretty good thinking for a boy of eight. And so I had to, you know, teach him a little of the doctrine of not only obtaining, but retaining remission of sins. And note how King Benjamin puts that here in uh, Mosiah 4. Uh, let's just hit a few of the highlights. Verse 12, Behold, I say unto you that if you will do uh, 
that if you do this, ye shall always rejoice and be filled with the love of God and always retain a remission of your sins, and ye shall grow in the knowledge of the glory of God, of him who created you, and in the knowledge of that which is just and true. Now, if you do what he's talking about in this chapter, then you will be filled with the love of God, and you will always retain a remission of sins. Let me put it this way. A person can live the gospel, and I'm not talking about so perfectly, but with such a posture of faith and commitment to the Lord that every time you retire to your bed at night, it will be just as though you climbed out of the baptismal font, dressed, and went to bed. You can go to bed every night with a remission of personal sins, and you can know it by the witness of the Holy Spirit. Now, you read Mosiah 4 carefully on how you do that. He goes on and he says this. These are some of the requirements. You will not have a mind to injure one another, but to live peaceably, and to render to every man according to that which is his due. Be honest and strict, and love your neighbor as yourself. Not better, not less, but as. And you will also, and you will not suffer your children that they go hungry or naked, neither you will suffer that they transgress the laws of God and fight and quarrel. Remember, when they're cutting it up and it gets out of hand, your remission of sin stands in jeopardy. And so be humble about it. And he goes on, and you yourself will succor those that stand in need of your succor. And, uh, of your, and you will administer of your substance. That's your pocketbook unto him that standeth in need, and you will not suffer that the beggar put up his petition to you in vain. And he has a discussion on that, and he finally comes now to the great concluding verse here, verse 26, where he says this in summary. Now for the sake of these things which I have spoken unto you, that is for the sake of retaining a remission of your sins from day to day. Now can that be done? He said it could. You see that? retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, that ye may walk guiltless before God. Now, you don't walk guiltless because you walk totally perfectly. You walk guiltless because the grace of Christ undergirds your life. And even when you fall on your face, if your attitude and your posture is such, and you get up and you say, Lord, I really got my face dirty on that one. But I'm going to hang in there and I pray for your mercy. And you can't follow that kind of falling on your face back and forth too much. And when it gets into serious transgressions, then you'd better really take stock and make sure you get reconciled to the church through your bishop. But uh, there is such a thing then as living in such a way so that the grace of Christ undergirds our lives. And we walk guiltless before God. He says, no, order to do this now. I would that you should impart of your substance I would that you should impart of your substance, he says, to the poor, every man according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and administering to their relief both spiritually and temporally according to their wants. Let me put it this way. Brethren, if you don't do your home teaching like you ought to, so that you truly minister to their spiritual, not just temporal needs, your remission of sin stands in jeopardy. You see that? Now, there are righteous works that are necessary in order for us to be exonerated, in order for us to be reconciled, so that Christ's atonement will take care of our transgressions. Note, for example, how the Lord puts it in section 104 when he talks about the economic law of the gospel indicating that the earth is full and there's abundance and plenty and you don't have to have starving people. And then he says, therefore, verse 18, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made and impart not his portion according to the law of my gospel, and there is a gospel law governing that, he shall with the wicked lift up his eyes in hell being in torment. Now, why will he with the wicked lift up his eyes in hell? Because if he doesn't contribute his substance to the poor. He cuts himself off from the atonement. 
If you don't pay your fast offerings, you cut yourself off from the atonement. And you will not and cannot have a remission of personal sins because there is a program not only of obtaining but of retaining a remission of your sins. And retaining means that you love your neighbor as yourself, you deal your substance to the poor, you teach your family as you ought, and under those circumstances, then you do the works of righteousness and justification by those righteous works brings you to Christ and he pays the debt from day to day. Now, do you see that general picture? All right, now there's such a thing also as justification by the Holy Spirit. Uh, years ago, many more than I want to recall back in time, I read Moses chapter 6, verse 60. And as I read that, my immediate response was, uh-oh, the Lord missed a cog there, slipped a cog. We got something in that scripture, that, and he didn't say it right. And somehow that isn't right. Now this is the statement that I read. As he talks about rebirth, and then extends the benefits of rebirth, he says this, For by the water, that is in baptism, ye keep the commandments. By the Spirit, ye are justified. And by the blood, ye are sanctified. Now it appeared to me at that point, in my naivety, that uh, this thing was exactly reversed. That you're justified by the blood of Christ. He paid the debt. Gethsemane was the thing that paid the debt. So you're justified by the blood of Christ. And the active agent in cleansing me is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which makes me holy as I get it into my life. See? And so it should read then that by uh, the blood ye are justified and by the Spirit ye are sanctified. And yet it's just the exact office and reverse. Well, that was an initial impulse what I repented of in my heart and then later sought the Lord for some understanding and I found out that the Lord's scripture is exactly like it ought to be. That's the way it is. There is such a thing as justification by the Spirit and that's just simply another part, another view of the house. Now what is justification by the Spirit? Well, it deals more with the process. Uh, as well as the condition of justification. Uh, let me put something here on the board just to, to illustrate. Let's suppose that you come here into mortal life at this point, and here's death, and the requirement of justification is to go right straight on through and walk that narrow path as Jesus did. But you do all right for the first eight years, and uh, that's because you're alive in Christ, and Christ exonerates you, and so forth. But then after eight years of age, you begin to dwindle off down through here, and this thing can go down how far it depends on the individual and his conduct. But you're somewhere down in here. And here's the, the line of rectitude. This is the line of rectitude, and this is the line then where justification exists. And you've got to be on that line in order to be justified. All right, now how does the Lord go about bringing us to that line? Well, he does it through the Spirit. See, the Spirit of the Lord reaches down, and what does it do? It strives with you, doesn't it? It strives with us even when we're not worthy, even when we were, as it were, in the gutter. That Spirit strives with us, and it's only when we really turn it off and turn it off and turn it off and turn it off that finally it ceases to strive with us, as the Lord warns in the Book of Mormon, does he not? See? All right, so the Spirit then reaches down, and as it reaches down and enlightens our mind or gives us something in the, in the sense of conscience and the something in the sense of, of the incentive to make the action, to change, and we then begin to move on up through to here, the Spirit then strengthens us and builds us, and we finally get up to where we're flying right, and how have we been justified then? We've been justified by the Spirit. Now, that's one expression of it. Another one is simply this, that uh, and it, comes, it comes out in, in this idea that uh, the Spirit grants 
a conditional reprieve even before baptism. Now that's a very important point to many people, the people of the Restora Reformation who believed and the Bible was put out and they read it and they believed and there was no priesthood on earth. Uh, it would be an unjust God who would not provide some means of reprieve and some means of, a, of abating the demands of justice in their behalf, even though the gospel was not there, see. Uh, it would be an unjust God. They could stand on the day of justice and say, hey, you, you clobbered me and you had no business because I didn't know any better and I didn't have any access to a means to get the remission of sins. Now, sometimes we think those people, for example, back in the early times of the Reformation and on up through to the Founding Fathers didn't have any of the Spirit of the Lord with them. Some of them had more, I'm, I'm sorry to say, than many Latter-day Saints have. And it was the straight bona fide gift and blessings of the Holy Ghost that they had. I come across this years and years ago back in Syracuse when I, when I checked out uh, Baird's History of the Huguenots and began to read and study it. The Huguenots were the French Protestants. And the, under the circumstances they were in, when they began to teach the Bible as they knew it, the Spirit began to enlighten their minds, and then the powers that be in those days began to operate against them. They finally came to this great massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day in the 1570s, where they literally slaughtered thousands of French Protestants. But prior to that, prior to that, then they, they would put these people uh, on the scaffold and start pulling them limb for limb or burn them at the stake. And they had usually give them the chance to speak on the basis they had re recant. But instead of recanting, they were filled with a spiritual power that just literally shone from the pages of the report. And uh, that spirit just, just was electric in its force and its power, enlightening. And they would speak to a whole congregation of people who was ready there to see them burned or hanged or something like this. And the powers of the Spirit would witness to them and give them strength and testimony. And they would bear testimony of Christ according to the best knowledge they have. And the powers of the Spirit would just touch these people and masses would be con converted to the Reformation. Literally masses converted to the Reformation. Well, these people had a spiritual power. I could see that, see. And that kind of ran smack against some of my more narrow concepts that I got from some narrow Mormon views that uh, it's only the light of Christ that, that offers any benefit to you until you come on up through and get the gospel. And that simply has to be modified. There is a different view. Now let me turn, for example, and show you a few statements in the scriptures uh, on, the, on the, a different, uh, more broad and compassionate program. I turn, for example, to section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 37 where the Lord is giving the prerequisites of baptism, the requirements now that we should uh, subscribe to, conform to, in order to properly be baptized into his church. Now, as you read that through, ask yourself this question. In a technical sense, does, baptism, does, does remission of sins come before baptism? Does it come with baptism or at baptism? Or does it come after baptism? Now that's an oversimplistic way of putting it, and I apologize for that because there's more to it than that. But let me read now with you. In verse 37, again, uh, by way of commandment to the church concerning the manner of baptism, all those who humble themselves before God and desire to be baptized and come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits and witness before the church that they have truly repented of all their sins and are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, having a determination to serve him to the end. Now note the next phrase. And truly manifest by their works that they have received of the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of sins shall be received by baptism in my church. Now when do they get the remission of sins? When they show that they have received the Spirit of Christ. We have a statement that goes in the church something like this. It's one of these false truisms in the church. And that is this, that the Holy Ghost will not dwell in an unclean tabernacle. Have you ever heard that one? Do you believe it? I don't believe it. I don't know whether you do or not, but I don't. 
It has to get in to sanctify you. How is it going to dwell in you? How is it going to clean you up if it doesn't get in? How is it going to refine and sanctify and change and transform you? If it's just shut off because there's some uncleanliness there or because you're fallen and corrupt in the Lord's view of things, the corrupt state. See how? It's got to get in because it's the sanctifying agent. You see that? Now what we really mean is this, I think that uh, the Spirit of the Lord never dwells in an unjustified body. Now, let me put it this way. Here, let's say, for example, as an individual, I'll draw an actual photograph. <laughs> and uh, he's out sinning around in the neighborhood and in the community. And as a result, he has no faith. The result of it then, the demands of justice are bombarding him. He hurts in his conscience, and yet he doesn't think much about it. He's blind. He's a natural man. He's an enemy. And he is wailing. You can tell by the look of his mouth that he's really not ha that happy. <laughs> All right, now you see that. Now that's the way he is. And here are the demands of justice. All right, now in order for him to be justified, there's got to be a shield set down. Once that shield goes down, then the demands of justice are checked and he stands free. All right, now, at what point does he stand free? At baptism or when he reaches up down here and the Spirit strides with him and he gets the Spirit of Christ into his life, then the shield goes down, right? And what does that do for him? It leaves him free of the demands of justice. He's headed in the direction of repentance. It gives him some breathing room to repent, gives some breathing room. Now we say that the Holy Ghost never dwells in an unjustified body. And by that I mean that until that shield is down, the Holy Ghost will not come in. But that shield initially goes down when you have the, or receive by your desire and your faith the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of your sins. You see that? Now, it's the same kind of thing that the prophet Joseph Smith talked about, the difference between the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost, here in the teachings, page 199, where he says there's a difference between the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost. He says, for example, and I'll get to it here in a minute, uh, he says, for example, Cornelius received the Holy Ghost before he was baptized. Now, can you get the Holy Ghost before you're baptized? Yes. What's Moroni 10 and 4 all about? How do you get a testimony of the Book of Mormon? Wait till you're baptized or before. Moroni 10 and 4 just says, and it's directed to non-members and to the Lamanites and all that, if you'll ask in the name of Jesus Christ and do so with an honest heart and a contrite spirit, he will manifest the truth of you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's before the Holy Ghost before baptism. Now, the Holy Ghost doesn't come to an individual with the demands of justice also bomb the Lord is merciful and he gives the Holy Ghost to you and he's clobbering you. You see that? Now he doesn't do that. It goes down. You receive the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of sins. And then the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, you can change that one. And then you're in what kind of a situation? It's a contingent, additional thing. The prophet says now, uh, if you receive the Holy Ghost in that sense, before baptism, receive the ordinances, then what happens to the Holy Ghost that, that gave you that testimony and enlightened your mind? It was, and you're left to yourself. Now, similarly then, a person is justified when the Spirit of Christ comes into your life and you evidence by prayer that the Lord has given you that testimony and that he has lifted the now, how then is baptism for the remission of sins? Well, this prior thing is a conditional thing based solely on the mercy of the Lord. Baptism for the remission of sins then takes that, condition, that conditional repentance, puts it into a sacred ordinance and a sacred covenant, grants it to us, this access then not to only obtain remission of sins only, but thereby day after remission of sins and puts us in that category. You see that? And so you're justified now by the Spirit. Is that clear? Okay. Now another way, and I've got to hurry on. 
another way then is that uh, the Holy Ghost ratifies all the ordinances of the gospel. Have you ever heard of the term Holy Spirit of promise? Some people try to associate that only with marriage. Now, what is the Holy Spirit of promise? Well, the Holy Spirit of promise, by definition, is the Holy Ghost, that person of the Holy Ghost. One of his functions is to ratify every ordinance of the gospel that's performed on earth. And until that ordinance is ratified by him, acceptable of the Lord. It may be on the records, but it's really not acceptable of the Lord. It may be there, and you might finally come around down the road away and do the qualifications, and so the Lord, the Holy Ghost goes back and says, okay, we'll let it go, and we'll let it work, see? But the Holy Ghost places a ratifying action on any ordinance, and then that ordinance is activated, and the promises associated with that ordinance are put into force, and those promises then vary according to the ordinances. The promise of baptism is the remission of sins. The promise of the laying on of hands is the right to the gift of the Spirit. The promise of the sacred ordinances of the Holy Endowment are to receive an endowment, to put power on you in those sacred endowment ordinances. The promises of eternal marriage, then, are not just that it's going to last forever. It uh, carries with the promises, then, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the blessings of Israel and the spiritual powers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in your lives as a husband and wife uh, and gives you the means and the keys and the means by which you can become a father under Christ spiritually of your children as like Abraham became the father of the faithful. See, Now these are the promises. Now when the Holy Ghost ratifies an ordinance, then he puts into operation the promise and hence the name Holy Spirit of Promise. You see that? The Holy Spirit of the promise is the Holy Ghost ratifying and therefore activating promises as they relate to the gospel plan. Now, this is true clear on up through to the highest ordinances of the house of the Lord, okay? All right, so, but when you're baptized then, even though baptism for the remission of sins, the, the Holy Spirit's got to ratify that. And so you're justified by what? By the Spirit. Now, in another sense, then uh, it's the Holy Spirit that brings a person of faith to the full and complete acquittal that the gospel offers. I don't really uh, get full acquittal until I've been sanctified. The Lord can't take all of my sins and put them in a little satchel or a little bag and wrap them up and drop them in a bottomless canyon and say that's the end of them until I have come up to the point where I'm stable, secure, been sanctified, and living fully his law, and he enters, allows me entrance into his kingdom. Now, when I get to that point, then the action of the Spirit has been required to bring me to that, and so final and ultimate acquittal then depends on the sanctifying, the gr developmental powers of the Spirit in my life. Is that clear? Now, the doctrine of justification then rapidly, justification by grace, that's the basis of it. Our approach then is one of faith, so justification is by faith. Then there is a works aspect to it, justification is by righteous works. And then there is the role of the Spirit, so that we are justified by the Spirit and sanctified by the blood. Now, hurrying on then, that's the first and basic program, and we associate this then with the preparatory gospel. See, that is associated basically with the preparatory gospel. It's clearing away the rubbish between us and God that's been built up. It's uh, erasing, then, the barrier that stands as a result of our sins. It's making things right so that when I stand on the day of judgment and the Lord becomes my advocate, he can, he can in his mind, say, this guy is reconciled to me. Therefore, I will plead the Father that he will permit this person entrance into the kingdom on the basis that I have paid his debt, you see. That's what it means. Now, sanctification goes beyond that. Sanctification is not merely the remission of sins. The word sanctify, uh, sanctification comes from the word sanctify, which means not just to remit sin, but it means to cleanse and to renovate and to purify from the effects of sin. 
Now, the doctrine of sanctification actually has two levels of operation. One is the cleansing. It's one thing for me to be uh, forgiven, another thing for me to be cleansed. For example, I've seen this illustration where you take a glass of clear water, and it's wonderful. And then you take an eyedropper filled with ink, and you drop it in it. And the first drop doesn't do very much. And so you have a nice drink. And then the second drop does a little more. And finally, after you get four or five drops in there, what happens to the water? It begins then to cloud up. And when you put more and more in there, it begins to cloud. Now, it's one thing for a person to say, well, let's forgive that episode. And it's another thing to go in and cleanse out the foreign elements. That's sanctification. We say sometimes that sinning is like beating nails in a board. And you start over here at this end, and each time you sin, you beat a nail in it, and you get over here, and you get the whole thing filled up, and you finally decide to repent, and you finally decide to apply the gospel program. And so, so repentance and the gospel cleansing process is like pulling those nails back out. But you still have the holes. You can't do anything with those holes. They're still there. You can put putty in them, but they're still there. Now, that is a false doctrine. That's a false doctrine. This is not an easy road to take, believe me. But that is a false doctrine. You can be sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of your body, just like section 84 says. And that renewal process is not merely to pull out the nails and not merely to plug up the holes. It is to knit back the fiber as though there had been no nail hole there to start with. And it's on that basis that people then become holy and without spot and enter into the presence of the Lord. Now, that's one aspect, then, of, of sanctification, the cleansing and the re-knitting and the rebuilding back. Now, another aspect is even more significant than this, and it's a higher expression of sanctification. And it centers around the idea not merely of being cleansed, but of being filled with the Holy Spirit, which is holy, a little h. When I am not only cleansed and purified inwardly so that I am whole, like, like Enos was said to be whole, and I have no more disposition to do evil because the substance of corruption has been largely renovated and purified by the actions of the Spirit. See, when I do that, that's, that's the, the basic level the basic level of sanctification. The higher level, then, is to go even further than that and be filled with that pure substance, which is Christ's divine nature, so that he dwells in us by and through his Spirit. See? And there's an indwelling relationship in which he, through his Spirit, is in us, like the Father, through his glory and power, is in Christ. And that filling process, since the substance of the Spirit is pure and it's holy, it makes me holy, but it isn't a negative kind of holy. It is a positive kind. It is an active kind. It's a kind, then, of, of dynamic righteousness and strength and power that's within me, a power of virtue, a power of holiness, a substance of power and of truth. Now, when you get to that point, then this is sanctification in its upper expressions. For example, Jesus once told a parable. It was a parable where uh, an evil spirit occupied a house, and someone came along and run the fellow out, and then thought it was a good idea to clean up the house. And so they went in and cleaned up the house and whitewashed it and just left it spick and span. They never filled it. They just left it clean, so it would be a nice-looking structure in the community, okay? All right, then the Spirit, having gone throughout the earth and wandered around, finally came around and looked back, and he says, hey, someone has cleaned up my pad. Now, this isn't in the New Testament language, but someone has cleaned this thing up for me, see? And so he goes out and invites all of his friends, and they come in, and the latter end of that person is worse than the first because they only cleaned him up. 
Now, negative sanctification isn't sufficient. You see that? Positive sanctification is, gets us into that realm of indwelling union with Christ, where he, by his Spirit, dwells in us, and there's a holy power within us. It bristles. You can tell its force and power by the witness of testimony and by the light and the truth and the revelation of the Spirit that centers in the person and emanates from him or her. See? Now, in the Book of Mormon, we have some good examples of sanctification. Let me just hurriedly turn uh, to a couple. Uh, one of them here is uh, in Alma chapter 13. Now, we want to talk about Alma 13 because it deals with the Holy Order. Uh, the Holy Order is the temple order. It's the, the ultimate order that will exist in its perfected form in the celestial kingdom, and it's the order of Zion on which Zion will be built. And it's that program then which, by which the Lord sends forth revelation and truth and power to the purification of his saints. It isn't done just individually, alone. It can be, depending on the person's faith, but more particularly, it's done in its fullness than through ordinances and within the program of the gospel. See, the Lord has given apostles and prophets and so forth for the perfecting of the saints. The saints aren't perfected without them. And that's why I've said that, that the keys of the priesthood are the gospel administratively because the your bishop and through your state president, you get close to him on the basis of his terms, not yours. I don't care what you think about him or that you can know more about him. You get close to him on his terms and work with him within that framework. And you'll feel a tremendous power that you, if you haven't been doing this, you'll never feel before. And it's the same thing with committing your life to the prophecy. The power flows. And there's a system through which the power flows. It doesn't through faith. It flows through the system. Now here he's talking about the holy order as a system. And he says in verse 11, Therefore they were called after this holy order and were sanctified. And their, blood, and their garments were washed white through the blood of the Lamb. Now that's sanctification by blood. Now note the next statement. Now they, after being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> now there's a different side of the house on this one too. Okay? Their, their garments are washed white through the blood of the Lamb. And then, he doesn't apologize, just goes on. And now they, after being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, having their garments made white, being pure and spotless before God, could not look upon sin, save it were with abhorrence. And then note this. I remember reading this years ago and just marveling and having a lot of faith in the fact that maybe I could do it because of what it says here. And it says, for example, and there were many exceeding who were made pure and entered into the rest of the Lord their God. <laughs> All right, now you're sanctified, and what one evidence of sanctification is, a lot of people, because of and social standards, look upon sin with abhorrence. The first time there's something goes wrong, they're ready to squawk to the mayor or to the bishop or something like this. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being filled with the love of God and the understanding of his life, the life that the gospel brings, and the enjoyment of that in its purity to such extent that any perversion literally causes you to cringe. Understanding, for example, the sacred sexual relations as they should apply in the gospel. And doing that with a great goal of what it would mean to stand with your wife on the day of resurrection fully perfected and with the, the full marital relationships, alive, vibrant, true, pure love, devotion, filling each other spiritually and physically, and doing that in the purity and the innocence of God's Holy Spirit, and having that image in your mind to such degree that when you see some of this RNX rated junk, you want to go out and vomit. Now when you do that then, and that is your response. That's one evidence of sanctification. Now let me turn to Helaman chapter 3. Here you have a group of, of uh, people 
who had lived the gospel under great adversity and uh, persecution, conflict, and uh, being bombarded by the media, whatever it was in that day. And it has this to say about him. Let's start with verse 33. The fifteen first year of the reign of the judges, there was peace also, save it were the pride, and this is what President Benson talks about, which began to enter into the church, not into the church of God, but into the hearts of the people who professed to belong to the church of God. And they were lifted up in pride even to the persecution of many of their brethren. Now this was a great evil, which did cause the more humble part of the people to suffer great persecutions and to wade through much affliction. Now verse 35 is the one I want you to one the one I want you to come to. Nevertheless, they did fast and pray oft, and did wax stronger and stronger in their humility, and firmer and firmer in the faith of Christ, unto the filling their souls with joy and consolation, yea, even to the purifying and sanctification of their hearts. Now the punchline is the next one. Which sanctification cometh because of their yielding their hearts to God. The more I study the Book of Mormon, the more I focus in on the example of Moses raising the brazen serpent in the wilderness as being the one simple thing that you ought to put out there in your mind. Here they were in the wilderness, snakes calling all around, they being bitten, no anti-serpent venom or uh, agent to help them out in that. But as all they had to do is look over to that television camera and just look, and they would be healed. Now, we're similarly in our life, we're like that. There are things bombarding, there's distracting us, there are things that would bite and that would poison. The thing that's really required, if you want to be a true saint, is to yield your heart to God. That's the thing that's really important. And focus yourself on Christ as your Redeemer. And know that the Father has given him, and the Father dwells in and manifests himself through him. See? Uh, another statement that's important. This was the teachings, page 51. Uh, I remember years reading this years ago, and... Uh, this fell in love with it to start with. This is one of the capsule statements now of the gospel. Has some questionable things about it. Let me show you. We consider, he says, that God has created man with a mind capable of instruction. <laughs> I'm being cynical. <laughs> and a faculty which may be enlarged, now note this, in proportion to the heed and diligence given to the light communicated from heaven to the intellect. He's not talking about academic learning. It's talking about giving heed to the light communicated from the heaven to the intellect. And that the nearer man approaches perfection, the clearer are his views. Now that's one evidence of being along the gospel path. The clearer are his views, and the greater his enjoyments till he has overcome the evils of his life and lost every desire for sin and, like the ancients, arrives at that point of faith where he is wrapped in the power and glory of his Maker and is caught up to dwell with him. Now, can you see that picture there? This isn't just a matter of setting up standards and, and uh, uh, principles and and ideas and holding to them, gritting your teeth. Yes, that's required, and sometimes it's uh, the greater part of valor to do like Joseph of old and to get yourself out of a situation. Sometimes it's better to do that, see. But in the process of sanctification, there's a positive thing. There's an input of truth and of light and of glory and of power and of joy and of happiness and of love. There's a sense of forgiveness and there's a sense of rightness. There's a sense of inner purity, and not just purity, but you begin to see how your life then begins to unfold toward Godhood. And that life that begins to unfold enjoys the unfolding process. And that, that life then as unfolds then 
it unfolds in all dimensions, not just the spiritual but the physical. And they're, they're unfolded in the right way, and the Spirit of the Lord bears testimony. And you finally get to the point where you see that unfolding of life and power and truth and gifts and fruits of the Spirit in you in contrast to the situation over here. And you lose every desire for that. And finally, you're caught up like the ancients in the Spirit and begin to enjoy the blessings of the Second Comforter. You see that? Now, that's what the Gospel is about. And I'm going to conclude at this point by just saying again now that there is such a thing as being sanctified by the blood of Christ. The atonement is the basis of it. There is such a thing as being sanctified by the Spirit, because the Spirit is the agent of sanctification and cleansing. There is such a thing as being sanctified by grace, because you don't earn this stuff. You just don't earn. You don't have any means of buying a ticket that will get you sanctification. You have to cry out for mercy and for for the grace of God and Christ through his mercy and his love has to fill you and cleanse you and this then is done by your desires and your hope and by his grace. And then there's such a thing then as being sanctified by righteous works. So going back now to section 20 verse 31, we know that sanctification through the grace of God is just and true to all those, and here are the works features, who love and serve God with all their hearts, mights, mind, and strength. And that doesn't leave anything over. You commit yourself in that way, and then you're sanctified by grace. Now, in that way, then, it's a process of growing true Latter-day Saints. The word saint means sanctified person. Uh, we have in the church Latter-day Saints and ain'ts and complaints, but the true meaning of the word saint is one, then, who has measurably gone through this process and enjoys this state and level, which is not a holier-than-thou thing. It's the kind of thing that President Kimball would manifest, when he's just the humble uh, but the outgoing personality. I remember the first time I really met him. It was back just after I got home from mission. They made me stake superintendent of the Rexburg Stake MIA, and we had a big regional meeting in St. Anthony, Idaho, and being the superintendent of the MIA, I was expected to be sitting on the stand, so I was there. And uh, But before the meeting, I was introduced to President Kimball. You remember the Twelve then? And I can still feel the impact of that man. He was standing about as far away from you to me, and someone said, uh, Elder Kimball, this is Hiram Andrus. He's uh, superintendent of the MIA at Rexburg State. Do you know what he did? And that was just totally open and totally pure. He came clear across, took me by both hands, looked me square in the face, and in a genuine, sacred, holy kind of statement, I'm glad to meet you. And the power of the Spirit that accompany that just literally buckled my knees. And it's that kind of thing, see, that I'm talking about. It's not the holier than thou. It's that kind of thing that is the evidence of a sanctified life. The well, Lord bless us to come to that, brothers and sisters, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We can encroach maybe on the next hour's time if we got any questions. Can we, uh, they've got some to hand in here, brethren. Okay, what happens to those who have committed an unpardonable sin? How can they progress? The answer is, if it's unpardonable, they can't. A person who commits the unpardonable sin becomes perdition. They die the second death, and uh, the reason for that is that they have sinned so heinously against so great knowledge that it's like a divinely lit campfire which goes completely out. 
and you can uh, blow on the coals and there are no coals there. And so a person then who commits the unpardonable sin then gets to the point where they become perdition and the only way they progress is retrogress on down the way under the power of second death. Are the doctrines that we are learning the same doctrines the saints were learning in Joseph Smith's day that have been lost or put aside? I don't know whether they've been lost or put aside. Depends on people. These, my focus has been on the prophet Joseph Smith. I wrote a master's thesis on the prophet, went back to Syracuse and wrote uh, an almost 700 page doctoral dissertation on the prophet. And academically, I spent my time researching journals, original sources, day after day, month after month, year after year, in order to get acquainted with him. And my effort has been to just fuse my mind into his, so that I could see things as he saw them. Now, in that sense, then, I maybe make an emphasis on, on uh, uh, the prophet. And some of these things, yes, we have not emphasized as much as we should. And we need, in some measure, to come back. Section 3 of the Doctrine and Covenant says, This generation shall receive my words through you. And we haven't got much beyond that yet. And in some measure, we've, we have failed to really see these things in the prophet as clearly as we ought to. So there may be an element of truth in that, but uh, I'd simply add the caution of uh, don't get negative. Don't get negative. In the sense, yeah, I look at it in the sense of opportunity. Someone hasn't learned as much as the prophet did, and you know a little about it. Do some home teaching. Get in and do it right. Yesterday you spoke of the little-known raining fire down out of heaven. Is that possibly atomic warfare? We will have some atomic warfare, both in America and in the world in general. But when you talk about the cleansing of the earth by fire, this is the manifestation of Christ's glory. And uh, so the cleansing of the wicked, where the wicked are consumed, this isn't atomic. This is the opening of the veil and the power of God's Holy Spirit centered in Christ being so concentrated and so pure that the wicked burn. Now let me give you a clue. They don't burn from the outside. They burn from the inside. Now why? Because the burning principle isn't like a blowtorch that burns from the outside. The burning principle is love, it's truth, it's intelligence, in such concentration of purity and so potent in power, then what it bombs in, the elements burn within, the corruption within burns. Can you see that? And so it isn't a blast furnace kind of thing, it's a burning by reason of the manifestation of glory which begins to cook the wicked within rather than without. Okay. Uh, what is the other two levels besides justification and sanctification? Well, that goes on up into making your, uh, getting the higher blessings of the gospel and uh, uh, the sealing powers of the holy priesthood in the house of the Lord and the blessings of the second comforter that open up through there. Okay, uh, in teachings of the prophet said that faith is power. This is the lectures on faith by the way, it says that. As God created the worlds, and if uh, stays together by faith, is this the type of faith that we had in Christ for him to carry through the atonement? Let me put it this way. The world is created by faith. You say, well, if God knows all things. How did he create the world by faith? Because you start from faith and premise, you don't know all things. Isn't that right? All right, a farmer, for example, may have been through the process of planting a crop and cultivating the fields and harvesting the thing year after year after year to where he's highly proficient. But each time he goes out onto the field in the springtime, that action is an action of faith. Each time. And in that sense, then, the Father has created worlds without number. But when he starts on this one, he starts on the basis, then, of knowing in his mind what he wants to bring, not having confidence and assurance, but the power by which he acts is the power of faith. It takes faith to exercise the power that he operates with. And so he acts on faith. 
And then he also acts on faith in the sense that the end is not fully there yet, and he's acting like the good farmer, knowing but acting on the basis of faith to realize the ultimate. All right, if there was no death before the fall, how can some Latter-day Saints believe God used evolution to get an Adam and an Eve to place in the garden? And that's a good one I'd like you to ask. I don't know how they can do that. You cannot believe in the doctrine of Christ and believe in evolution. It simply cannot be done. You are rationalizing to the point that you deny Christ and you deny the scriptures if you believe in the theory of evolution, in the origins of life. Now, you can believe that there's such things as mutations and changes and that kind of thing, and there's a limited. But you cannot believe the theory of organic evolution because there was a creation and the world was up here and there's no death and there's a fall. And that's how it happened. Now, don't buy what the sectarians say about the creation. It was created in 24... Uh, six 24-hour days out of nothing. I mean, there's an LDS view that can reconcile the evidences of geology and other things that can do that and still leave us the creation story fully blown out, full in meaning in the scriptures. That is possible, and someday we ought to get a Latter-day Saint with enough faith to do that and promulgate it. Well, thanks for your time, and we'll take five minutes, okay?